I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Good evening, everyone. Peace. Uh, my name is Taki, and I'm just happy to, hear, happy to be here tonight with you guys uh, for another installment of Happy Talks. Um, tonight, we have a very special guest with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Malafe Asante. Um, but before we get into the interview, I just want to go over a couple things. Um, our next screening for Happy is December 26th. It's a Saturday, first day of Kwanzaa. Omoja, please come out and join that screening with us. If you don't want to wait for the event, you can actually get a, a DVD or you can get the digital download. Um, you can watch the film immediately. If you just can't wait to December 26th, understand people may be a little anxious and that might be too much time for them. Um, with that being said, uh, we wanna thank everyone for uh, helping us get to 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. From the bottom of my heart, bottom of our hearts, we wanna say thank you to everyone for being a part of this. Um, we're still striving, still going forward. Um, so please, with that being said, please like, share um, this video. Um, also, we wanna take a, a special note to all those who support us, those the followers, the day ones, um, people that can always come out to all the, all the happy talks, all the different screenings and everything that we do. Uh, Marcus Shop, much love to you, family. That's important. Omawali Africa, uh, the brother's definitely a big, big, been a big support to everything that we're doing. Just want to definitely say, you know, thank you to everyone that's been involved with this, this endeavor. Um, <clears throat> you know, we have a couple other things. You know, we talk about cooperative economics. And tonight I was wearing uh, my shirt from my man, T. Harden. Um, definitely one of our happy shirts, the happy compass. Um, definitely want to get a shout out to T. Harden for, you know, always rocking and supporting the happy movement and what we're doing. Um, it's very important to, you know, be a part of this. And you can definitely go support the program by going to the happyfilm.com um, and going to the merchandise page. And when you're doing that, you're helping us support other black businesses as well, which is extremely, extremely important to what we're doing. Um, like we said tonight, very exciting program. We want to, don't want to hold this up any, more long, any longer because you know we don't have much time. We want to get right to it. So Dr. Malefe Sante is professor and chair of the Department of Afro Africology at, at Temple University in Philadelphia. He's a co-founder of Afrocentricity International and is a president of Malefe Conte Asante Institute for Afro Afrocentric Studies. Asante was a guest professor at Zhengjing University, Hangzhou, China, and is professor extraordinaire at University of South Africa. He's the founding and current editor of Journal of Black Studies and the first director of UCLA's Center for Afro, 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 Afro American Studies in 1969. Asante often is called the most prolific African American scholar, has published 93 books among the most recent uh, the Perilous Center of When, we, when Will African Center Hold Radical Insurgencies, History of Africa, Third Edition, and many, many more. Uh, with that, without further ado, we're going to introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Asante. Hello, how are you doing? Good to be on your program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Happy Thank you. is a good title. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Definitely want to get a shout out to all those involved in the happy movement. So Dr. Asante, you know, generally we kind of get started with people just telling us a little bit about themselves. Um, if that, with that being said, can you just kind of give a little brief overview of your life and your experiences, sir? Well, I was born in Valdosta, Georgia, and just a couple of nights ago, uh, I understand that Donald Trump was down there talking about cucumbers, but I grew up picking cotton and uh, working in the tobacco fields. But uh, Valdosta, Georgia, of course, is at the very bottom of Georgia, right before you get to Florida. And uh, interestingly, uh, there was a great uh, uh, historic murder, and I call it great because it was perhaps one of the most horrific murders ever to take place in the early part of the 20th century, Mary Turner was lynched for standing up for her husband's uh, innocence. And uh, Mary Turner's great, great uh, granddaughter uh, is my sister-in-law. And that uh, experience, I think, uh, sort of changed a lot of people in Southern Georgia. And in fact, 
we grew up with a strong determination to always be people who would be fighting for the nobility of African people and uh, to have a sense of character. So I grew up in Valdosta, Georgia and uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And I went to school in uh, Texas, Oklahoma and, uh, U and, and California finishing at UCLA. Um, and then uh, became the director of the, well, actually taught at Purdue and then became the director of the UCLA Center for Afro-American Studies uh, and worked there for three years and then went to Buffalo where I became the head of the Department of Communication. And for a couple of years, I was the head of communication as well as the head of the Department of Black Studies. And uh, at the, all this time, I had been editor and have been editor of the Journal of Black Studies which I started along with Robert Singleton in 1969, and it was published by uh, Sage Publication. Um, and uh, I guess uh, otherwise, I've, I've traveled to Africa many times. I lived in Zimbabwe, worked for the Mugabe government uh, as a trainer of journalists um, in 1980, uh, from 1980 to 82. Uh, I was also, uh, uh, very active uh, with the uh, work of the ANC as well as ZANU uh, and ZANU PF, um, and um, uh, have been quite uh, deeply engaged in Pan Africanism, working with several African presidents, including Obasanjo of Nigeria and Wad of Senegal and Mbeki of uh, South Africa. So. Uh, I, have, I landed in uh, Philadelphia uh, after so many years in, in 1984. And, fr and from 1984 uh, till this time, I have been at Temple University. And uh, that, that, that's sort of a brief overview. Wow, it's an impressive resume. You know, and when I think about it, and like I said, we're trying to, uh, looking forward to this interview for a very long time. Um, with that being said, you've written more than 90 books. With you know, with 2020 being the 40th anniversary of your first text, I believe, Afrocentricity, the theory of social change. Of all the books you've written, which one would you consider to be the most important? Well, you know, I, I guess it's almost like when, when when parents have children, it's almost impossible to say which one is the most important or the best or this or that, because they all have different characters. But but let me just tell you what I think about the character of, of the books that I've read. For me, if I were a person uh, looking for consciousness, I would definitely believe that uh, Afrocentricity is the, is the first book that you ought to uh, come in contact with. And the reason I believe that is because many people have told me that. So many people have told me that I came to consciousness after I read Afrocentricity. So it's almost like me when people ask me, how did you come to consciousness? I say, I came to consciousness because I read George James' Stolen Legacy. I read Sheikh Hunter Job's The African Origin of Civilization. And I, you know, I mean, so, so you have your, your, your books that you say, wow, these are the books that brought me. So many people have told me that Afrocentricity uh, really has been that book for them. Uh, however, for me, uh, overall, I think one of the great achievements that uh, of my work may very well have been the history of Africa, uh, because it was the first time that an African had ever attempted to write a comprehensive Africa uh, a con uh, hist history of the continent. Uh, there have been people who have written West African history. There have been people who have written Southern Af African history. And uh, th there have been other people who have attempted uh, different aspects uh, uh, of uh, African history. And one of my great mentors in terms of his own work was a man by the name of Joseph Kizerbo, who was from Burkina Faso. And uh, Kizerbo uh, had written uh, the history of sub-Saharan Africa. But as an Afrocentrist, I always believe that Africa is holistic, that you cannot talk about uh, sub-Saharan Africa because uh, the Sahara is Africa. People live in the, in the Sahara. Black people live in the Sahara, have always lived in the Sahara. So you, you have to write the whole history of Africa if you can. And the book is now in its third edition. 
uh, it will soon uh, be going through its fourth edition. I'm collecting uh, information about that now. And uh, because I wanted to write a, uh, a, an Afrocentric history of Africa, uh, the idea is to have African narratives tell the story, that it is not European history in Africa. It is not the British in Africa. It is not the Dutch in Africa or the Belgian in, uh, Belgians in Africa or the French in Africa. That, that is not my aim. My aim is to have the stories of African people told by African people about how they see uh, the historical mission of uh, African people who are the first people. In fact, the most uh, uh, ancient people in the world are uh, African people and all the people in the world have DNA that comes from Africa. So, so this was, so those two books are important. I, yet I think that the Encyclopedia of African Religion that was edited by myself and Amma Mazama is also perhaps one of the most critical books in the Afrocentric uh, and, and, and the Afrocentric episteme. And the reason that that book is so important in the Afrocentric uh, episteme is because we didn't talk about African religions, we talked about the African religion. And so we wanted an encyclopedia of the African religion because our point was that all uh, African so-called uh, traditions are the same, that they have different names because they're different languages, but essentially the uh, commonalities of those experiences are, are the same. And you, the, the best you could say is uh, much like the Christians, they're different denominations, but ultimately, uh, the Yoruba and the Zulu and the Kikuyu, uh, the Bamaleki, the Igbo, uh, the Eve, the Wolof, uh, the, the, the Shona, all, all these people have uh, similar uh, uh, experiences and philosophies, and uh, they may call them by different names, but, uh, the, idea, uh, but, the, uh, but the idea is the same. It's always been the same, and that is the fundamental thing that we have to uh, understand and appreciate, I think, about African culture. And so that's that's my, that's uh, th th I guess that's what I could say about the 93 books. The 94th book, actually, uh, there, there've been a book on uh, just recently, uh, I did on um, Pan-Africanism called uh, the Afrocentric uh, Pan-African vision, uh, Pan-Africanist vision. And the reason I did that book was because for me, uh, I read a statement that was made, uh, which I thought was really off center, uh, when someone said that uh, Pan Africanism uh, equals socialism and socialism equals Pan Africanism. Well, that is not correct. That is totally wrong. And in fact, uh, I understood precisely why uh, this was made a, um, an equation. Uh, it, it was made an equation because after the 1945 Pan African. Congress that was held uh, in Manchester, uh, the, the great influence uh, had been uh, George Padmore. And Padmore had been a, a, a propagandist for the Communist Party out of Moscow. He lived in Moscow. He'd worked in Moscow. And so all of the uh, people who were at that uh, Congress were influenced by uh, Padmore's understanding of how do you confront Western capitalist uh, imperialism? And, and that was a necessary move. I understand the tactic, but what it did was to define for most African people, uh, the notion of Pan-Africanism as being uh, uh, deeply connected to socialism, uh, particularly Marxist socialism. And that uh, I think has colored for a long time, the notion that the only radical position uh, for black people is a position that's based on Marxism. And uh, as an Afrocentrist, of course, I reject that out of hand. I mean, it is not, uh, it is so clear to me that the mistake that was made in 45 was that we did not have uh, African people who had interrogated African culture enough or who understood enough about our own traditions and uh, our own uh, values uh, to develop a uh, philosophy that emerged as a radical philosophy uh, out of an episteme that was African, that was fundamentally African. And so we fell into the trap that if 
uh, we couldn't uh, be uh, capitalists and didn't want to be imperialists. The only thing we could be was Marx. Uh, 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 we could be uh, would be Marxist, and, and and I think that 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 was a problem, and that still is a problem to me with Pan Africanism as it is interpreted by lots of people. So that's why I just wrote this book that came out uh, a few months ago. Okay, Doctor, so you open the door for a couple things, and the first thing we want to make sure is that people support um, our elders and our great scholars. Um, where can people go get these uh, works of knowledge, for these uh, works of wisdom of yours? If they want to support and buy some of the books. I'm sorry. Uh, my books, mo uh, my recent books are really published uh, with the exception of two of the last seven books uh, published by Uni Universal Right uh, uh, Press. So a uh, publication, so UWP. So if you look up, Google UWP, uh, and put my name in, you will you will find all my books uh, for the most part. The, 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 the two that were not published by UWP uh, over the last seven were published by Lexington Books. So, uh, but if you look at Amazon.com, uh, you will find all my books. All your books uh, on Amazon. Okay, great. We want to make sure that people actively go and use this platform as an opportunity to, you know, spread it to spread it the world. You've been doing this work for many, many years. And we want anything we can do to support you, or get people to support you is tremendous. And we definitely want to. I appreciate, that. I appreciate um, that. Thank you. You know, be active in that. Um, Afrocentric. Um, it's been said that you're the father of the word Afrocentric, or the term, or the, the, the movement of Afrocentricity. Can you please explain how that started? Yes, I can. Uh, I am not necessarily the father of the word Afrocentric. Uh, I am, of course, I the most important uh, proponent of the concept, the theoretical ideas around Afrocentricity. It had never been defined before me, as far as I can understand and I, as far as I read. But the word was used mainly uh, uh, by uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah in relationship to the Encyclopedia uh, Africana, in which he had wanted W.E.B. Du Bois to ensure that the encyclopedia was Afrocentric, that it was not Eurocentric. And that was a statement of fact that he, he intended for the encyclopedia, as Du Bois developed it, uh, to concentrate on Africa and not concentrate on Europe. I think that was the intent. There was no def defining of it. He just made the statement. And then later on in 73, there, were, there, were, there was a, uh, three issues of a magazine that was called the Afrocentric Review, but the term Afrocentric was just in the title, but it was there was never any, any explanation for it. And in fact, there were there were, there were no articles that I saw uh, in the copies that I finally were able to get a few years ago that wrote anything about Afrocentric or Afrocentricity. So uh, in 1979, I wrote the book Afrocentricity, and I published it in 1980. Uh, and in that book, what I tried to do, and I think what the, the whole idea was, was how do you look at the African experience, particularly over the last 400 years that we have engaged Europe, at least on this continent, and even longer if you talk about uh, South America, and maybe longer if you uh, talk about uh, the uh, Portuguese uh, in probably five, say four to 500 years. If you look at this experience, what it did was to remove Africans from all of our terms, whether it is the clothes that we wear, whether it's our names, whether it is our religion, whether it is our values, uh, whether it is uh, our respect for our ancestors, uh, so that uh, we were basically uh, taken out of a milieu that was our own, where we were located fundamentally as people who were subjects of our own reality. We were not on the margins of Europe. We were not on the uh, fringes of the Chinese. African people were, uh, we were ourselves in the middle of our own historical uh, experiences. And there's nothing more correct for us than our own historical experiences. Wh whatever we do, whatever we learn, whatever we know from other people 
It is only our own historical uh, experiences that will give us uh, an understanding. I like when Marcus Garvey used to say that, uh, that the voices we hear in the most serious moments ought to come from our own depths. If they don't come from our own depth, then what happens is that uh, the European or the Chinese or the Indian or the Arab will define for us our own reality. And so it was in response to that dislocation that I wanted to deal with this question of how we as African people could reorganize our cultural responses to where we were and not to become European, but to become African. And the more African we became, then the more human uh, uh, we uh, exercise, uh, more, more we exercise our humanity, you see? Otherwise, we, we become imitators. We, we, we become people who simply uh, uh, look to all concepts, whether they're concepts of beauty or truth or psychology or uh, sociology. We just look to Europe and Europe cannot lead us. They, they don't have the moral capability because they have everywhere been against humanity. And Fanon said this a long time ago, even when he was in his early 30s. So it, it is not even uh, an issue. I mean, one doesn't even have to raise that question. Europe can learn from Africa, and that's what many of their intellectuals are now saying, I mean, uh, uh, Sousa Santos has already said that, that basically what Europe has to do is to learn from what he used to call uh, the, the epistemologies of the South. But, but, but he's talking about learning from us in order to make Europe better. But my thing is we ourselves have not embraced ourselves. And that's what Afrocentricity is about. It is the idea that African people view the world from our own uh, historical reality. And then as we view the world from our own uh, historical realities, uh, we are then able to create a reconstructed understanding of who we were. There, there are no people who ca came up with writing before we did. There are no people who envision the concept of the future before we did. There's nobody who named God before we did. The first people to name God, to, 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 to announce the name of God, were people on the African continent. The first ones to name the days of the week were Africans. The first ones to name children were Africans. So, so why? Have we, those of us who are the mothers and fathers of human civilization and culture, why do we become children? So Afrocentricity speaks to that. And it's almost like uh, <laughs> the great day. I was a member of SNCC. In fact, I led the SNCC chapter when I was a student at UCLA. And one of the things that H. Rap Brown used to say was when they say it's uh, raining outside, you got to look because if they, they, they're liars. They lie every time. If they say, oh, you better look. You, you don't know. So, so what Afrocentricity is, is a way of looking. If they say they're talking about uh, the clash of civilizations, then we have to say if, if Huntington, uh, the great political scientist of the uh, reactionaries, in America for a long time. If he says that there will be the clash of civilizations, we have to say the only reason he can think like that is because he comes from a civilization of clashes. We have to reinterpret everything. They're not going to tell you, to, they're not going to give it to you straight. And in fact, the experience of the demagogue, Trump, who has just been defeated in the election in 2020, it should tell us and teach us that here is a prime example 
of someone who has taken all of the values of the Eurocentric world and they've been bottled up into this one personality. He's selfish, he's individualistic, he's materialistic, he, he is, uh, he's not deep when it comes to thinking intellectually. Uh, he doesn't care about anything but himself. He, so all, anything you can say, I mean, he's non-spiritual. Uh, he is awkward when it comes to associating with other people. He's non-generous. I mean, he despises other people, assumes that he is superior to them, when of course he is totally not. But, but I'm just saying to you, this is an incredible uh, world that we live in. So the Afrocentric understanding was, as African people, we are captured in effect, in a society that has given us, has taken from us first, and then given us a set of values that are not ours. And I think I first learned that from the influence, to be honest with you, of Maulana Karenga on me. And the reason I can say that is because in the 60s, uh, in uh, California, uh, he would make the whole argument that our fundamental crisis was a cultural crisis. And that stuck with me as a young student, that the fundamental crisis, he said, is, is, is not a, it is not a crisis of uh, poverty. It's not a crisis of the lack of housing. It's not a crisis of not having enough money. The crisis, the fundamental crisis, is a is a a a cultural problem. It's a cultural crisis, you see. And until we can get a handle on the cultural crisis and deal with our culture and 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 love our ancestors respect our ancestors. Until we can do that, we can never, never walk in the light of the traditions of nobility that were the steps that they took long before us. This, our resilience comes from that, but we don't know it. <laughs> we, we, we think it came from, at a big discussion not long ago with uh, one of the preacher leaders in our community um, saying how God brought us through, the, 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 uh, the, the, the gospel brought us through the enslavement. The, the, we didn't come through the enslavement because of Jesus Christ. That, that is not, that's not, the, that's not the source of our resilience. And in fact, that may very well be the source of our punishment the source of our horrible, uh, the, the brutality against us came out of the Christian doctrine, at least in this country. I mean, it came out of Islam in other places and still does in other places and Christians too. So we cannot run to either of those places. If we run to those places looking for protection, we will not find it. The only protection will come from us looking into ourselves and asking ourselves the question that all Afrocentrists ask, what were we and who were we before we encountered the Arabs and the Europeans? Um, you can answer that question honestly. And if you don't know, then you go and study and you ask the elders, you interrogate it, you study it, make it a lifelong journey of study because you can't know everything. This is why I told you, I'm not writing the fourth edition of the history of Africa is because um, a couple of years ago, uh, after I visited Cameroon two or three times and, uh, and had been received by the other people of Cameroon and had gone to Bimbia, and uh, had stood there in the sacred spot where so many Africans left the continent of Africa to come, in fact, more than left it almost any other part through Bimbia and Cameroon. Most people don't know that. Even the Cameroonians didn't know that. 
that, that this was this was more important in a sense in terms of just the history of the enslavement than Corey. That this was the incredible uh, uh, factory of violence against African people. But in this beautiful, incredible region of Cameroon, Bimbia sits there as a great standard. Uh, the scholar Lisa Aubrey went there and she saw it, made it a personal mission to tell people about this place. But, it's, but, but I'm saying until we go back and dig deeper into our own cultures, we will not even know what we have lost. That's the point I want to make. What have we given, what have we given up? You know, I, I, I look at our culture today, say the African-American, I mean, because we are just one uh, particular uh, ethnic community of Africans, uh, even in the Americas there. There are many, and when I say ethnic, I'm simply saying that there are people who have uh, particular ancestors that we relate to. Um, and the, the Jamaicans, for example, uh, relate to, uh, to, to Nanny, uh, Queen Nanny, of course, who uh, was one of the great fighters. The, there's a great history there. Um, and we, we relate to Harriet Tubman and Nat Turner, um, the great fighters also. So, so, so when you look at these different ethnic groups, what you see is that none of us, neither of us, I should say, have ever dealt with the real deep traditions out of which we have come. More than 250 different ethnic groups of Africans. That's more than 250 languages came to the Americas. And those 250 languages of people uh, are the people we see today. We, 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 of course, mix with all of the other people. Uh, the, the, the Akan people mix with the Wolof. The Mandinka people mix with the uh, people who were Dan and Igbo. There are all these, there are all these mixtures of Congo people and uh, the various people from Angola. All this, this is all, this is all, this is the, this is the African American, the Bamileki, the Bamu. These are all African American people. Now you look at you, hey, hey, who are you? Who are you? And then we mix with all uh, many other groups of people too, including native peoples and European. So, so we had all these. So the African American is the quintessential person of the future. This is the futurism that we talk about. I'm my, I got a colleague, Aaron Smith, who's doing a book on Afrocentric futurism, which is a wonderful term, because basically what we've got to do is to take these traditions and we have got to advance them into the future. They're not just cont contemporary, but of course you have to study and you have to know. And it doesn't mean you have to know everything because we won't know everything. Um, last year, I got the chance to go to Nzala Ilanga in uh, in Pumalanga in um, in South Africa near the Indian Ocean near Mozambique actually and uh, it was very interesting for me because uh, going there I, I and, and please uh, Taki let me know if you want to in a you know in a beam, uh, and let me uh, and give me your know, question <laughs> no, because. I mean, I'm just talking. No, I mean, Jules is coming, and I, I, I listen. I'm not going to stop it. You know, as okay. it comes out, it's it's a powerful. Um, we do have some other questions here, but definitely just you know, okay. Okay. continue with that. You was on the coast of the, the west coast, and yeah. you know. So, so what happened? What had happened to me? It really, really, and and I and I must I give a shout out to the South Africans. I always tell people that the most, uh, uh, the, the, my greatest. Uh, a group of people who 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 love me, or 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 the South Africans, because in South Africa we have the largest group of Afrocentrists. I think, and I think there's a reason for it. I mean, I am 
Uh, I'm there a lot. And in fact, uh, uh, last week they gave me a, an honorary doctorate from the University of South Africa as a, doc, a, a D field and a D lit. And um, so on one of my trips to South Africa, I was reading on the airplane a book where a guy was talking about Adam's calendar, Adam's calendar. And I read about it. It's a white guy talking about this. And uh, when I got to South Africa, I asked people, did they, had they, do they know about this? And of course, most, none of the Africans knew. I mean, that I asked and other people know. I said, well, this is amazing. This guy says that this site is over 100,000 years old and that it is probably the oldest site of megaliths, uh, stone structures in the world. And, and, and it's, it's, it's here in South Africa. So uh, last year, um, uh, uh, Professor Manla, uh, um, uh, who was actually, uh, 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 he actually was the Makanya, who was the, Manla Makanya, who was the vice chancellor at the University of um, South Africa, said to me, come to South Africa. I want you to spend a week at the University of South Africa, and I want you to teach my whole faculty, 1,200 people or so, however many. But I want you to go from College of Agriculture, College of Law, College of Social Sciences. You spend a day with all of them, giving them the Afrocentric lessons. So it was, it was, it was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. I told him, I said, no HBCU has ever asked me to do this. But I said, they should because it's, it's, it's essential. And he says that for our scholars, our African scholars, they've got to be brought back to themselves. I remember talking to the people in agriculture and the brothers say, well, what do we do? All the thing we know about agriculture is what the white people wrote. I said, well, didn't you grow up in a family? Didn't they raise food? Didn't they grow food? How do they do it? What did they grow? I said, you got the very basis right there in your, in your village. Go and ask people. You, we knew how to eat before white people came, but the idea in the academy is that all knowledge begins with Europe. That, that's a big problem. And I told the law people the same thing, that maybe we need to change the Dutch law that they're using. You mean, you know, get, get out of this whole system that they have created because Europe has created it for itself. But the point of the matter was that after I said that, I would ask people, have you ever heard of Adam's calendar? And they said, nobody never heard of it. And one finally somewhere in Johannesburg at one of the university, one of the uh, campuses of the university, uh, somebody, four people raised their hand out of about 200 and they said they'd heard of it. And three of them were white, one was black. So I said, mm, this is very interesting. I've got to see this place. So uh, a few months later, I went to South Africa and, and when I got there, a colleague of mine, uh, actually one of my um, my, my, my mentees, Sisanti, uh, um, uh, Dr. Um, Simpiwe Sisanti, uh, said, uh, Prof, uh, let's go to Mpumalanga. So we flew, we flew from Johannesburg, got there, got a, rented a, a, a four-wheeler, uh, went on up, looked to the mountains, went into this place and lo and behold, there are these stone structures that were put up by Africans 100,000 years ago. This is older than, Stonehenge is about 3000 BC. This is about 100,000 BC. And not only are these stone structures there, but they have also shown that there were like cities built out of stone that are this old. This is the oldest, a monumental site in the world, in the hit in the world. And I asked people, the university people, people like Manla, uh, Makanya, and other people uh, who were scholars and who knew so much, uh, Dr. Massimola, um, uh, 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 Sister Lindewe Zungu, and uh, Brother Vusi Gumadi. I asked them, I said, well, why the Africans don't know about this? And they didn't know about it because after 1948, 
white people took over private lands and they own and control more than 80% of South Africa was in the hands of white people, including the most historic places like in Zalo Elanga was owned by a white farm. So there's no way Africans could go there after 1948. So we forgot, we, it, we forgot that it was called the place of the rising sun. We forgot, we didn't know anymore because they had put Africans on these town uh, ships and in these places away from their land. So part of what Afrocentricity does and what Afrocentricity is about is changing the episteme so that the, the epistemology, so that we ask ourselves, what is the real truth? Because we know what they're telling us is not true. Right. Because they never, tell, they never tell us that which will help us. That is not in their interest. And this is why Michael Tillotson is right when he calls it agency reduction formation. The aim of the European, it seems, always in terms of knowledge and in terms of the advancement of Black people is to figure out how you could create formations to prevent Black people from advancing. That's the agency reduction formation. I'm going to, you, you're going to exercise agency, I'm going to reduce it. And that's what, that's what we're against. So that's why we always say, well, we are resilient. What we're meaning is that we're fighting against the odds all the time. And we are. Because Europeans are not going to come to you and say, you know what, I'm going to show you how you can advance uh, your, your particular position, your particular truth, your particular vision. I, I, I'll show you. I'll, I'll help you. I mean, I'm in a position to support you. I'll support you. Oh, no, that's very rare. In fact, if it's offered to you, be very suspicious. So that is the position, I think, that we take when we are... Um, uh, Afrocentrist, and that's where Afrocentricity comes from. Okay, you know, there's so much to dissect there, but one of the things I'm going to hone in on is the um, the site. Can you spell it yeah. for the for the family, please? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the the Europeans call it Adam's uh, calendar uh, because the, the man who uh, supposedly uh, had a plane wreck and walked up and found it was called Adam, and he called it Adam's calendar. Uh, you can Google it and see that, but the African people call it uh, Inzalo. Uh, I'm, I'm not pronouncing it in the Zulu fashion, but uh, you, I can't do the clicks, but let me spell it for you in English. I-N-Z-A-L-O, and then capital Y, comma, I'm sorry, uh, uh, um, apostrophe, and then capital L-A-N-G-A, Enzalo Ilanga. Now, if we will translate that. What would the translation be? The, the, the place of the rising sun. Right, the place of the rising sun. Right. That's, that's possible. Even when I think of a place like Napta Playa, this place, it seems like it was similar in terms it, of the Absolutely. It, 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 you're, it, you're very, very, very correct, sir. Uh, it, it is similar to Napta Playa, but it is larger, much older, and uh, it is the uh, uh, same, sa same idea, same structure of the megaliths being uh, developed and placed uh, in Africa. But this, this site uh, has uh, more than, um, uh, more, uh, probably more than 50,000 stones. It's a massive site. Uh, it starts in one place and it goes on and on and on. It's, it's an incredible place. Well, so, did you take uh, did you take a lot yeah, I did take some photographs. I sure did, uh, uh, but um, but I, I'm 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 not uh, satisfied with them because uh, I wanted to stay longer and take more and do more, and I will go back there. Uh, I am sure very soon and and do that, but. Uh, Anyone who can should try to see it. Right. Happy movement. Happy talks is on the move. This is a powerful discussion. Please like and share this video on all your platforms. Um, Dr. Sante, it's been a pleasure. Um, as being the founder and director of the unique African Studies Program at Temple, the experience when you develop scholars on the master's and the PhD level, 
how would you describe your success at Temple and its unique Afri African African <laughs> studies program? <laughs> well, well, that's a good question. But my my time at Temple has been turbulent, to say the least. But uh, yes, uh, the but the establishment of the PhD program is one of the most historic things that I think we have done as a people, because to establish the PhD program at a major university or at any other university where you don't have a model, there, there's, there was no model for the PhD program before I created it at uh, Temple University. But um, um, what, once it was created, what it allowed us to do as uh, Afrocentric scholars uh, was to uh, create our own discipline, you see? Because Afri Af uh, African-American studies, as we saw it, was not just uh, an aggregation of courses about black people. There had always been courses about black people and black people have been studied for 200 years before us. So that was not the issue. The issue was how do you establish a perspective, a way of viewing reality that's based on the African values and culture and tradition. And that's why we now call our program Africology, which uh, is an Afrocentric study of African phenomena transgenerationally and transcontinentally. And what that means is that we can study uh, uh, African phenomena, whether it's uh, housing or uh, social institutions, whether it's uh, religious traditions, we can study all, any phenomena, uh, any, uh, any African phenomena, wrestling in, in uh, Nubia, uh, and we could do it uh, uh, transcontinentally. It could be in Brazil, or it could be in Suriname, it, it, Jamaica, Haiti. It doesn't, doesn't matter, transcontinental. And um, we understood by this, when we say that it was uh, uh, transcontinental, we understood that it would involve all of the generations, it could be transgenerational. So it could be in 1500 BC, or it could be in 1500 uh, this era. That, that's why we say transgenerational, and then we say Afrocentric, see? So Afrocentric means that you study from the standpoint of the African people. You're not, you're not imposing Europe or China on African people. It is what African people have said and what African people do. So this was a historic, um, actually, entry into the Western Academy because it allowed the Western Academy to see the value for the first time, whether they saw it or not, we saw it, we appreciated it, of training people uh, who were firm and strong in all forms of knowledge and who went back to ancient Kemet as the very beginning of knowledge and not to Greece, um, who understood the Imhotep and, and started with Imhotep and not with somebody who came 2000 years later, you know, that's just a whole different orientation. And we have now graduated more than 180 people with doctorate degrees from Temple University. We, we have produced more PhDs in uh, African American studies or Africology or Africana studies than almost all the other programs combined. That's the value and the power of, of this idea. So, so the idea has been, uh, you know, it, it's been um, knocked around because we have had people who uh, have not appreciated Afrocentricity. I mean, for about 14 or 15 years, we had uh, a couple of people who ran our program who were totally not Afrocentric. In fact, they tried to destroy what we had built earlier on as Afrocentrists, you see? And so it was, a, it's always been that battle, that tug of war between Africans who are trained in a European discipline, but who, who refuse to commit discipline suicide. And I always tell people that when I came to Temple, and in fact, before I became Temple, even when I was uh, uh, teaching communication, I had already begun to commit discipline suicide from communication. I said, you know what? This, is, this does not work for me. I don't understand. When they say that a speech is an uninterrupted spoken public discourse, that doesn't even sound right to me as an African coming from Georgia, because I know that when people speak, other people have to say something. 
It has to do, it, you, when you say uninterrupted, you know, and that's your definition of a speech, you're telling me that all those people that I used to hear in Valdosta, Georgia, were not giving speeches because they were always interrupted. So I, I so there's a, there was always this tug with me of what is truth and what is my truth? How do I come to it, you see? And this is why I think the PhD program at Temple is so uh, uh, valuable. And after that, 10 years later, we got the, the second one at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and um, which was not an Afrocentric program. And then the one at Berkeley, which is also claimed not to be an Afrocentric program. So you, you got programs now that I think there are about 17 different PhD programs, but I always say that if, if you don't have a discipline, and you are in the university, you can easily be taken over by any other discipline. And that's basically what has happened in a lot of places. Let me just tell you this, because I think the community needs to know. The University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee was a place where one of the people who went to school with me at UCLA, Winston Van Horn, used to teach there. He was a great professor. He was a brilliant thinker. And he held in the 1980s, he held a conference that brought Maulana Karinga, myself, Asa Hilliard, and several other scholars together to talk about this term Africology. And he created this uh, notion and he made the department, he changed the name of the department at, Afri uh, at Wisconsin Af to Africology. And then what happens, and this happens a lot in Black Studies, because Black Studies, when it doesn't see itself as a discipline, they can hire anybody and anybody who needs a job. They say, well, I, want, I, I can't find a job in history, so I'm going to find me a job in Black Studies. I can't find a job in uh, Queer Studies, so I'm going to find a job in Black Studies. I can't find a job in Marxist Studies, so I'm going to find a job in Black Studies. So Black Studies becomes one of these places where all kinds of people can join a department, but they're not part of the discipline. That's a problem for the field. And I've tried to point this out for 20 years, that the big problem for the, for the discipline itself, uh, or rather for, for Africa, what was called Africana Studies also, Africana Studies, Africology, the big problem is that if you don't have a discipline where the, the people who are in the department, department is just an administrative structure, but the people who are in, if they don't all agree to the same perspective. So, so it's, for example, at Temple, you won't hear anybody talking about African slaves. And why? Because we got a discipline. We can talk about, we say enslaved Africans, but we, we don't talk about African slaves. That's why in, 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 in Temple, you won't hear people talk about uh, uh, Black Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa. Why? Because we've got a discipline. We know that Africa is one. We, we, don't, we are not in that. But if you got people who don't understand that, then that's a problem. If you're in Africology at Temple University, you understand gender and you understand gender complementarity. You have an understanding of that. You don't have to go to uh, a European to give you some direction about how to think about gender. That's, that's, not, that's not possible. If, you, if you're clear about African culture, you can find everything you need right in African culture. Powerful. So what made Temple so unique that you were able to create and birth this uh, PhD program there? Was there anything about the university itself there were there were there were there were several things. There was a confluence, really, and and always it seems like this happens. Uh, the first was that the um, the uh, president of the university at that time was a man of Greek, uh, uh, had been a second generation Greek, Peter Leochorus, who said that he wanted a program that would be the best. Uh, uh, he said we live we are in North Philadelphia, and Temple University in North Philadelphia, which is a overwhelmingly black community need, need should have the best uh, uh, African-American studies program in the country. That was the commitment of the, of the, of the president uh, who hired me. Secondly, we had a black executive vice president whose name was uh, Pat Swigert, who later became president of Howard University. 
Pat Swigert also was extremely very supportive. And we had a provost, a woman named Barbara Brownstein, who was very, very supportive. And uh, we had a dean, Lois Cronholm, who was supportive. So we had those, those four people. And then we had a board of trustees that was comprised of five or six black board members who were very strong, including one minister, Reverend Nicholas, Nichols, uh, and also uh, Bill Cosby at the time was on the board. So with, with the confluence of that, plus you had an activist like myself, and you had a South African who was in history, but who I later, whom I later persuaded to come to us, his name was Cato, uh, Sethlani Cato. So uh, when, when Cato came over, uh, we had at least uh, the two of us, Plus, we hired one person. We had about five people, and we created uh, this 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 uh, program, uh, which actually I wrote it, and uh, I was supported by these people that I later hired. So it was uh, it was very very powerful, and I think so. The confluence of things you have to have the right right mixture of people. If you don't have, I mean, because if we if we had had, for example, a black person at the head who was anti African then we couldn't have done it. But, but fortunately for us, we, we had, a, we had a, a president, a Greek president who understood immediately the idea, the Afrocentric idea. And then we had uh, uh, you know, a provost who understood, Barbara uh, Brownstein understood greatly, and uh, so did uh, Pat Swagger. And, and they were, they were the, the strength of, of the PhD program at Temple. So what were some of the processes that were put in place to sustain it? Because I'm sure over the you know years it's been in place, it's been fought with some fought with different challenges. How was it able to be sustained? Fighting. Fighting. And I and I give I have to give credit to Ama Mazama, who was a colleague who also uh, fought very bravely, in fact, had to sue the university uh, over a number of issues. Um, there were many ways uh, that uh, 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 people, other departments tried to undermine us. Uh, the chair of sociology said that it would be over her dead body that we would ever succeed. Um, we, we have had, even currently, I mean, we, we, have, we have an initiative that Temple has said that they're going to hire um, an additional uh, four people. But, uh, the, but it's in our department, it allow us to hire additional four people. But uh, it, it has been fraught with all kinds of uh, uh, reaction from other departments, you know, uh, saying, no, it shouldn't happen. And, uh, you, know, you know, Europeans always, that's the agency reduction formation. <laughs> you get on one hand and say, okay, we're gonna make an initiative. Then you get somebody from political science or somebody from geography or, or psychologists saying, "No, why are you giving those four lines to black studies?" You know, so so there's always that that struggle. So we have to negotiate those struggles, you know, and so forth. So so that that is ongoing. So I think how we sustain it is with a commitment number one to truth, to excellence. We really are. We do believe in excellence. Um, and we we fight many battles all the time, and our students fight many battles. Uh, there, there, of course, as you know, probably, there are African Americans who fight against Afrocentricity. So there are people on the outside of Temple who fight against it. We, we've had that uh, occasionally in Philadelphia. People think that when we say Afrocentric, it means that we're not going to study anything about Black Philadelphia, you know. So, so if Philly is much like Philly, and I call Philly and Brooklyn my other homes because you know, the people, I understand those people, they understand me. So so it's like, you know, no man, when, when, when y'all, they tell me y'all getting rid of Du Bois. No, we're not getting rid of Du Bois. I mean, we're not gonna do that. So, uh, you know, because they, they assume when they hear the word Afrocentric or Africology, they think only, they're only studying Africa. You see the continent. This is the, that's the mentality that you have to deal with. So of course we teach African-American literature. I taught the African-American novel uh, last year. So it, it's, a, it, it's a, those are the struggles that we have 
um, um, external and, uh, of course, as I said, internal, the lack of money, the lack of support for our graduate students. We now have 40, 42 graduate students uh, this uh, time, and uh, I think we can only fund about 11 or 12. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a struggle. And we've had some outstanding students. I mean, Eddie Gloud got his master's from Temple. Uh, Ibram Kendi got his PhD from Temple. Um, you know, uh, 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 Paxton Baker uh, got his uh, BA. Um, um, you know, I mean, um, uh, Jesse Williams got his BA from us. So we got we got many outstanding. Crystal Temple, Catherine Van Coley. We got some really outstanding, major, major uh, thinkers. Who uh, Raylan Rabaka, a brother who's written about fifteen books at the University of Colorado. Is 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 one of one of the top Du Bois scholars in the world, and uh, uh, James Conyers at uh, University of Houston has published forty books. So we we have a we have a strong uh, group of uh, people who are doing everything. So much so that uh, recently, uh, actually, this uh, uh, in two three weeks. Uh, Timothy Sams, one of our former PhDs, will become the president of SUNY at Old Westbury. So we just got we just got a lot of good support from people who've gone through Temple, who have been through it, and they see the value of the Afrocentric idea. So that's that's the that's the real real deal. Doctor Dante, I know we're real short on time, but you have a time for one more, one or two yes, more. Yes, sure. Okay. Um, this is we're going to switch up a little bit, but. The DIA conference has been, I know, um, uh, a pillar in the community. And you're talking about, as you spoke about the um, the individuals that graduated on the BA, uh, master's or PhD level, uh, first thing that comes to mind is leadership. So my question for you is how significant was the DIA conference in terms of development of new leadership? Thank you very much. It's a good question. The, the DIOP conference was the source of so much scholarship and leadership. Um, and un unfortunately, I, I, after running it for about 20 years, I gave it over to a group of students, uh, former students who are professors, and they, they've struggled to, to maintain it. Uh, and with COVID, for example, for the first time, I think we had it online. Uh, but uh, Dr. Jennifer Williams, uh, who is teaching at Laola Marymount out in uh, California, is the president of the, the joke. Uh, international conference now, uh, but it, had, it it created a lot of leadership. We we let me just tell you the start of it because it's important. We started it. I met Sheikh Anta in 1980, and when I met him in his office in Dhaka, uh, I was so happy and eager. I ran up to the great man and you know, mon frere, you know, I'm so happy to meet you. You are my, you know, everything. I want to be like you. I want to defend Africa. And he said, young man, Africa needs no defense. The only thing you have to do is to advance, 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 advance. Even when your enemies come for you, do not stop to defend, advance, advance. That is my motto. That's the way I do. I advance. I got so many people who clip, who come at my heels. I, I don't don't even worry about that. I advance, 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 and so it's out of that meeting that I got the idea. Later on, when we created the program, and the program was created in nineteen, the first students came in nineteen eighty eight, and the first graduate was uh, Adeniyi Koka, who is now the uh, director of uh, the School of Theater at San Diego State. He's a Nigerian. He he became the first PhD that we we uh, we gave. But I got the idea that we needed a conference to go along with the creation of the doctoral program, so that people can do their Afrocentric research and can be honored and rewarded uh, by virtue of their scholarship. But we use Sheikh Anta because. Uh, he was, in my judgment, the most significant African intellectual of the 20th century. That, that, that Du Bois, you know, in 1960s, 
the African scholars met and they gave awards to both Du Bois and to Sheikh Anta. Uh, but the difference between Sheikh Anta and uh, Du Bois, in my judgment, because Du Bois wrote far more than uh, Sheikh Anta Job. But uh, what Sheikh Anta Job did was to reorganize and reorient the thinking of all African history. So that the, Du Bois was a great historian. He was a great sociologist. But what Job did, he said, I'm not gonna go down the route of European sociology. I'm not gonna go down the route of European his, history. What I'm going to do is to question the very foundation where Europe stands. And, and that to me made him the most important uh, intellectual we have. Because for me, it has, it has created my life. Wow, powerful. Dr. Asante, you've been doing this for a very long time. What's new on the horizon for you? Well, uh, I, am, I am definitely uh, looking forward uh, to completing my book on various characters in the Black Studies Movement. And uh, it's going to be called Characters and Characterizations. And I'm working on it now. Okay, thank you. Family, happy movement. Please go out, support this elder, um, his books on Amazon. What's the other site you said, Dr. Sam? Uh, you said uh, UWP, uh, Uni Universal Right uh, Publications. Yes, got to give him heartbeat props. Say it all the time here on the Happy Movement. Uh, please go out and support this elder. It's extraordinarily important. Um, as you say, it's the only PhD program that we have producing African centered scholars. Um, it's the first and only, so we, we got to keep this going. And you know, we love you, we salute you, and uh, we got to get you back on the show another, at another time, another place. Um, you know, we'd love to have you again. Uh, uh, Jed Sanam, no problem. Okay, Thank you. okay, take care, sir. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Wow, family, peace. <laughs> that was a great exchange. Um, it was brief, but it's very powerful. With that, we're going to close out the show, but we definitely want to say that, you know, we thanked all our supporters, uh, King Simon, Philippe Matthews, Rep Shock, um, Tutti Films, all those support the Happy Movement. Um, this is what we're doing, family, is about the Happy Movement. We just heard from the extraordinary elder himself, Dr. Malefe Asante, just how powerful this is. It's, it, was, it was amazing. Um, I was kind of blown away. He told me to interrupt him. I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm glad I didn't because something really came out of that. Um, the place of the rising sun, you know, that's definitely something we need to talk about, something we need to do some research on. But it goes to the understanding that civilization came from the south and went up north into into the continent, into actually into the Nile Valley, into Kemet, or newly into Kemet. So um, with that, please like, subscribe, share the, share this video. It's extremely important. Um, we need to get this out to people, the algorithms fighting against us. The only way we can get this through is people liking it and sharing it in all platforms, please extremely important. Um, next screening of Happy, Saturday, December 26, 7 p.m. Um, with that comes the extraordinary panel discussion with the esteemed um, cast members. Only if you have a ticket for the screening would you be a part of that panel discussion. It's very similar to this discourse we had here. Um, also with that, if you don't want to wait, like we always say, you, need to, you can go to get your DVD on, on, at happyfilm.com. You can also get the digital copy happyfilm.com as well. You can watch that right now. Um, please support the, the program, the channel. You can go to your t-shirts, um, other merchandise we have as well. With that, we want to say thank you. We love you. Good night. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?